Hi, kids. Here's a picture of the book I want to read to you. It's Common Sense by Thomas Paine. One of the so much founder fathers that had the good sense that we needed to get this nation going. And it's small. Look how small it is. How tiny. So, I want to read you this, because common sense, you know what common sense is, don't you? Common sense pretty much equals do no harm to yourself or anyone else. And that is common sense. Like, for instance, when you turn off a stove burner, don't touch it. I taught you that when you was little. Do not burn yourself by touching something after you turn the fire out. That's one thing. Tell me what else you think about it. Okay, it's 7.04. And I'm going to quit in about 10 minutes. I might have to make another one. And here it goes. And the introduction says, Perhaps the sentiments contained in the following pages are not yet sufficiently fashionable to procure them general favor. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a for formable outcry in defense of custom. But the tumult soon subsides. Time makes more converts than reason. As a long and violent abuse of power is generally the means of calling the right of it in question and in matters matters too which might never have been thought of had not the sufferers been aggravated into the inquiry and as the king of england hath undertaken in his own right to support the parliament in what he calls theirs and as the good people of this country are grievously oppressed by the combination they have an undoubted privilege to inquire into the pretensions of both and equally to reject the usurpations of either. In the following sheets, the author has studiously avoided everything which is personal among ourselves. Compliments as well as censure to individuals make no part thereof. The wise and the worthy need not the triumph of a pamphlet, and those whose sentiments are injudicious or unfriendly will cease of themselves unless too much pains are bestowed upon their conversion. See, I knew it had to do with pain and suffering. The cause of America is in great measure the cause of all mankind. Many circumstances have and will arise which are not local but universal, and through which the principles of all lovers of mankind are affected, and in the event of which their affections are interested. The laying of a country desolate with fire and sword, declaring war against the natural rights of all mankind, and extirpating the defenders thereof from the face of the earth, is the concern of every man to whom nature hath given the power of feeling, of which class, regardless of party censure, is the author. P.S. The publication of this new edition has been delayed with a view of taking notice, had it been necessary, of any attempt to refute the doctrine of independence. As no answer has yet appeared, it is now presumed that none will. The time needful for getting such a performance ready for the public being considerably past. Who the author of this production is, is wholly unnecessary to the public, as the object for attention is the doctrine itself, not the man. Yet it may not be unnecessary to say that he is unconnected with any party, and under no sort of influence, public or private, but the influence of reason and principle. Philadelphia, February 14th, 
1776. Common sense of the origin and design of government in general with concise remarks of the English Constitution. Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. The one encourages intercourse, the other creates distinctions. The first is a patron, the last a punisher. <coughs> Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an, in, an intolerable one. For when we suffer are, or are exposed to the same miseries by a government, which we might expect in a country without government, our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we furnish the means by which we suffer. Government, like dress, is the badge of lost innocence. The palaces of kings are built on the ruins of the bowers of paradise. For were the impulses of conscience clear, uniform, and irresistibly obeyed, man would need no other lawgiver. But that is not being the case. He finds it necessary to surrender up a part of his property to furnish means for the protection of the rest. And this he is induced to to do by the same prudence which in every other case advises him out of two evils to choose the least. Wherefore, security being the true design and end of government, it is unanswerable follows that whatever form thereof appears most likely to ensure it to us with the least expense and greatest benefit is preferable to all others. In order to gain a clear and just idea of the design and end of government, let us suppose a small number of persons settled in some sequestered part of the earth, unconnected with the rest. They will then represent the first peopling of any country or of the world. In this state of natural liberty, society will be their first thought. A thousand motives will excite them there, thereto. The strength of one man is so unequal to his wants and his mind so unfitted for perpetual solitude that he is soon obliged to seek assistance and relief of another who in his turn requires the same. Four or five united would be able to write, raise a tolerable dwelling in the midst of a wilderness. But one man might labor out the common period of life without accomplishing anything. When he has felt his timber, he could not remove it, nor erect it after it was removed. Hunger in the meantime would urge him from his work, and every different want call him a different way. Disease, nay, even misfortune would be death, for though neither might be mortal, yet either would disable him from living and reduce him to a state in which he might rather be said to perish than to die. Thus necessity, like a gravitating power, would soon form our newly arrived immigrants into society. The reciprocal blessing of which would supersede and render the obligations of law and government unnecessary while they remain perfectly just to each other. But as nothing but heaven is impregnable to vice, it will unavoidably happen that in proportion as they surmount the first difficulties of immigration, which bound them together in a common cause, 
They will begin to relax in their duty and attachment to each other, and this remissness will point out the necessity of establishing some form of government to supply the defect of moral virtue. And I will go to number two in a moment. 